Hi everybody, thanks for joining us. I have got the privilege of speaking with Al Bowers from NASA. Al, can you give us your position? What do you do there at NASA? So, I'm one of the chief scientists at NASA. Um, I'm the chief scientist at NASA Armstrong, and uh, we're located out at Edwards Air Force Base. The, the big project that I've been working on the most part is what we call Prandtl. And uh, the re Prandtl actually stands for something, and so the, the long version is Preliminary Research Aerodynamic Design to Lower Drag. So we usually drop the D off, we just refer to it as Prandtl. And the, the big deal that we call it, the reason we call it that, one of the earliest founders of aeronautics as a science mm -hmm. was a professor named Ludwig Prandtl. Okay. He got his doctorate the same year that Wilbur Norville Wright flew the Wright Flyer at Kitty Hawk, 1903. Wow. So I, I usually make a joke about 1903 being a good year for aviation. <laughs> I would say so, yeah. <laughs> so Prandtl is the one that figures out how wings create lift. Mm -hmm. And uh, he comes up with a tool that allows them to figure this out. And so once you have a tool, you can do the math and you can figure out the optimization. You can figure out what's the lift distribution across a wing that produces the minimum drag. Okay. And this is the big deal and by the way, his first answer to this problem is published in all the textbooks. And all undergraduate aero engineering students have to learn what this and how to derive the math. Mm -hmm. And the answer to the question is always elliptical. You get an elliptical load distribution from one wing tip to another, and that produces the minimum amount of drag for that wingspan. Gotcha. But you notice I didn't say that's the minimum amount of drag for that wing. It's for that wing span. Bam. So here's the trick. Yeah. Prandtl continues to work on this problem for another 12 years after this. Okay. So he publishes that in 1920 for the elliptical load. Mm -hmm. And then in 1933, he publishes another paper. Okay. And almost everyone ignores mm -hmm. this paper. And so in 1933, he publishes a paper called On Wings of the Smallest Induced Drag. And he says in the second sentence and in the last sentence of this paper, and it's only two pages, 11 equations, two tables, and a figure. So it doesn't look like much It on doesn't the look like much, yeah. yeah. I mean, I can hand it to you on one sheet of paper. Okay. And it's, it's never been officially translated into English. Mm -hmm. um, I have a couple of translations, one that was done by me, so it's really bad, <laughs> and uh, one that was done by some pros, but they weren't aero engineers. Okay. They knew German really well, but they were an aero engineer. Sure. So we, you, when I read these two versions, I can kind of figure out what Prandtl was doing. But what he said is the, the new load is if you, if you imagine the wing that holds this elliptical load, mm -hmm. how much material is that? What is the structure necessary to hold that load for what you have, you're going to carry? Yeah. And so you figure out what that material is, and it could be a pile of balsa that's this big, or it could be a chunk of carbon fiber that's as big as this table, mm -hmm. or if you're talking a real airplane, I mean, it could be a huge slug of aluminum that's as big as this booth. Sure. Okay, so now you're talking a couple of tons of aluminum. What's the minimum drag you can get out of that material? And that's what his second paper is about. And so once you pick the size of the vehicle, uh -huh. this second paper is what's the less, the least amount of drag you can get out of that material. Sure. And so what he does is he says the new load to do that doesn't look elliptical at all. In fact, it's bell-shaped. So it tapers to the tips yeah. and it comes up in a hump at the middle. And so there's another problem that people have been trying to solve all these years. And mm -hmm. Wilbur Norville started out this way, and but they gave up on it. Okay. And that was looking at the flight of birds. Mm -hmm. Birds don't have vertical tails in order to control their yaw. Sure. Real pilots, I have a little training as a real pilot. Mm -hmm. Real pilots know that when you roll the airplane, you create more lift. When you create more lift in order to bank the airplane, in order to be able to turn, you more lift, you get more drag. So the airplane rolls the correct direction, but it yaws but it the wrong way. And all pilots know this. The RC pilots here at the AMA Expo all know this. Mm -hmm. They know how to coordinate the roll with the yaw. 
And so they, they use the rudder in order to get the roll and the yaw to get the airplane to both roll and turn the direction that they want. Yeah. Wilbur and Orville Wright run into this problem and they had to solve it and they did. And that was their big deal before they could put power on their airplane and go fly. And they did that at the end of 1902. And then 1903, they go back to Kitty Hawk and they fly the airplane. Sure. This is why it's such a big deal what Wilbur and Orville did. We still solve the problem that way. But when we added that vertical rudder mm -hmm. in order to control the yaw, we got away from birds. Birds don't have that. They don't do that. They don't do this as, at all. Yeah. So no one has ever figured out why birds were able to do this. Sure. And so our airplanes that we have at our booth, mm -hmm. the Prandtl wings, it turns out Prandtl actually solved the problem, but he didn't know he'd done it. And nobody read the paper and no one thought about the problem in this particular way until I came along mm -hmm. and I had an intern with me at that time and I'm looking at this data and I calculate it and it says that there should be no adverse yaw that in fact what happens at the tips is instead of drag there's a little bit of thrust mm -hmm. at the wing tips and so if you have thrust at the wing tips and the way you do this is with twist Mm -hmm. If you have a little bit of thrust at the wingtips, when you create more lift, you create more thrust. And so now when you roll, you yaw the correct direction. And this is what birds do. You've seen them do this. I mean, you watch seagulls soaring along the beach, right? Yeah. And they they just glide along, and it looks like they're just steering with their fingertips. Yeah. That's exactly what they're That's doing. That's what's happening. They, they're using their fingertips in order to be able to turn. And no one does this with airplanes. We use that vertical tail to do this for us. Sure. But if you can get rid of that vertical tail, that's 30% of the drag. Wouldn't you like to oh, save 30% wow. on your tip, on your on your trip? Oh yeah. For your your fuel bill that you'd have to pay. Sure. I, but the wing is also more efficient when you do this by about 12 and a half percent. And so you start putting all these numbers together. It turns out it's about half is what you could save on this. That's, that's what we're out proving. And we do this with the uh, intern teams. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that I get these kids who've just graduated from college and, and kids that are undergraduate and graduate students from college that come and spend their summers with me and we go out and we fly the airplane, we instrument the airplane, we fly it, we gather the data and we're writing the report. We're trying to get that published right now. So this is the Prandtl project. They're working on, on some things that could really change the shape of aviation. Exactly. You shared something with me. We spoke a little bit earlier this morning. Uh, one of your mentors at one point had told you um, one of the best compliments that you could get. And you said, this is something that no one would ever actually say to you. You know, people talk about, you know, leaving your mark, your legacy on, on whatever it is you do. Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, we all aspire to that, to have something that you can point to and say, yeah, this was mine, mm -hmm. right? And um, I had this, this one mentor and he was very old man. He retired in the middle 1980s. And uh, when he first started in, in just after 1950, he was working at Edwards Air Force Base for the predecessor to NASA, was the NACA then. Mm -hmm. And he was working on a project and the test pilot was a man named Chuck Yeager. And he was working on the X-1 and he was the drag guy. And so he was gathering all the drag data on the X-1 mm -hmm. and he put all the data together and this is the beginning of his career, and at the end of his career, he's telling me the best compliment you could ever have is if you change the design or the shape of aircraft in some way. And I look at airplanes and I see how he changed the shape of aircraft. Sure. He had a couple of things that he discovered during his time. And so Ed Salzman is one of those guys. And, and I look up to Ed in this way because he changed the shape of aviation. And my interns and I, I think we're on the edge of being able to do something like that now, too. So I understand that you have a modeling background. I do. Um, in fact, you really have just an incredible story uh, that we spoke about a little bit before the interview began. Uh, would, you, would you be willing to share with us a sure. little bit about your story and your modeling background? Sure. So um, people hear my title, Chief Scientist at NASA Armstrong. And that's a pretty big deal. And I get that. And 
it can be very intimidating for people when we first meet. And I never intend it that way. I keep telling people that I'm really an ordinary guy. And if you really knew me, I mean, you'd, you'd know the number of times that I trip on my own shoelaces and, <laughs> you know, I, I can't even count change right. And, you know, I, okay. So um, when I, I, I was not born in the United States. I, I was actually born in Japan. And um, my mom is Japanese. And English is not my first language. I, I grew up the first few years of my life in Japan. And, um, it's a big city too, I understand. Yeah, well, it was a small fishing village. And it's on a small island that's like an eight hour boat ride from the main island in Japan. Um, but uh, yeah, little tiny fishing village, population of less than 30 people. And so when my mom and I leave there, um, it was kind of a big deal. And uh, my dad was U.S. Coast Guard. There was a, a navigation station that was across the bay there. Mm -hmm. And that's how my mom and dad met. And uh, we, we came to the United States. I was almost three years old. And for the first five years of, of uh, I, until fifth grade in school, um, I was in remedial English. And, and I don't talk about this very much. I'm, I'm embarrassed about it, actually. And, but I realized that there are kids out there, and many of them who could, who love airplanes too. They come from places, really small places, they don't speak English, or the kids might be the only ones that are bilingual and mom and dad don't speak English. Right. And, but they, if, if, you, if you love airplanes, if you love aerospace in this way, you know what it is to run outside and look up because you hear a noise and you want to see what kind of airplane is that. Sure. And to this day, my kids, when they're over at the house, I'll be sitting inside and they'll say, hey, Dad, what kind of airplane is that? I don't know. All I hear is a jet engine. <laughs> right. And we'll run outside and it'll be a U-2 or the B-2. <laughs> this is living out near Edwards, yeah. okay, right? So sure. it's not normal for most people. Yeah. But it, it, you can relate. And um, so I, th this is where I started. Right after we moved to California, my dad got a job in aerospace. He built spacecraft. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he took me to the Point Magoo Air Show. And so you can imagine this kid, he's almost four years old. He's got his fingers through the chain link fence, the Point Magoo, watching the airplanes. And uh, I knew what the X-15 was, okay? okay? And there's this F-104 comes in and the commentator says, uh, and this is a NASA F-104 that's doing a, X-15 style, low lift to drag ratio landing. This F-104 comes in, and I can remember thinking it was the X-15, right? right? To this day, I still think about this, and I know it can't be. And, and it comes in and it lands, and I, I can remember this part vividly, still to this day. And I turned around, and I looked at my dad, and I said, someday I'm gonna work there. And my dad burst out laughing. And now I actually do work at that place. And about uh, 15 years ago, um, Bill Dana, the mm -hmm. X-15 test pilot, he came down to my office and I related this story to him. He says, come with me. So he took me over to the ops office. And they have these green binders. And he pulls out the one that's marked 1963 and he flips it open. And he goes, Point Magoo Air Show, that was like the middle of October. Oh, here it is. Look at that. Bruce Peterson flew that F-104 that day. I went from being that kid that had no hope of ever working at anything in aerospace to being that kid that ends up at the place. The, the pinnacle the, of the, it all. The, where, yeah. And I get to do some really cool stuff at a really cool place, and they pay me to do it. I love it. Which is a little and, bonus on the side. Oh, by the way, after I had done all this for all these years, I started building model airplanes. And I started out with stick balsa, and I graduated from tissue into, I remember monocoat, when monocoat came out. It was a huge big deal, film. You could just iron it on and then take out all the wrinkles. That was so cool. Sure. And, and then, it, you mean I could stretch this around corners too? Whoa, this is so awesome. You can do so many things now. Yeah, right? Yeah. I had no idea. So, and uh, uh, so I built, Sailplanes. It was what I, I was really into free flight sailplanes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was mowing lawns so I could save up for my first RC set. And uh, I unfortunately made a mistake. 
you know, I made made that funny left turn and I ended up, I had the money for the RC kit or I could buy the stuff to actually build a hang glider. Southern California, 1970. And I had that article in National Geographic, 1971, where they're talking about Otto Lilienthal and the, the bamboo and plastic hang gliders. My dad and I built a, an aluminum and, and plastic hang glider and I, 13 weeks, I, six weeks after my 13th birthday, I soloed in a hang glider. Um, oh, wow. By the time I was 15, I had over 400 hang glider flights. I had an invitation to the, a qualifier for the U.S. Nationals. Oh, wow. And uh, I was working in a hang glider shop. And um, we moved overseas again. And uh, we ended up in a place where I was too young to fly hang gliders. But I was allowed to fly sailplanes, so I made that switch. And so I graduated high school. I was in a, a sailplane club learning to fly gliders, sailplanes. Sure. Came back to the United States. And um, I went to uh, Cal Poly, mm -hmm. got my degree in aero engineering. I had no idea what aero engineers actually did. Sure. I got an internship. I mean, none of us knows what our job is really is yeah. before we show up the first day. Sure. And I, I, I got an internship. If you can get an internship, this is the way to break in. You get your foot in the door, people know who you, it's, think of an internship as an extended interview process. They're looking at you and you're looking at them to see if it's a good fit. And all of a sudden, I mean, the next thing I knew, I hadn't even graduated from college yet and I had a job offer to work for NASA at Edwards Air Force Base for crying out loud. So. It was like I couldn't sign the paperwork fast enough yeah. in order to accept that. And I was an aerodynamicist for 20 years. And then I was the chief of aerodynamics and I took a few other uh, management jobs. I went to Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. and I worked at NASA headquarters for a little bit. And then I came back to California and I ended up chief scientist. And I figured out something kind of fundamental about airplanes and about birds. and my students said, come, if you're a student, please come and, and work with me for a summer. You won't regret it. It's an unbelievable story. Well, I have to say, I don't regret sitting down and speaking with you today. This, I can speak with you all day long. This has been an amazing interview, and I really appreciate you sitting down with us. Just a regular guy. Remember Just a regular guy. Just a regular Absolutely. guy. Absolutely. You see anything at the show here that excites you this oh, year? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I had no idea about um, the Horizon guys with their DLG Whippet. Uh-huh. And I saw that, and it's like, must have. Have to make a little room on the way home now. Yeah, I, it, 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 yes. Well, so, Mr. Bowers, thank you so much for taking some time with us this morning. Absolutely. We really, really appreciate it. I had a great Thanks, time Mr. speaking with you.